So that we shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Deepak Meghur. Um, I'm always uh, with these, uh, all the kind of videos which you see on the YouTube and on the, in the different webinars, uh, would it be enough to call him a prolific surgeon, a versatile surgeon, an immensely capable surgeon? It really beats me. And uh, he's uh, uh, heads the Meghur Eye Care Center and is with the extra interest in cataract glaucoma and complex cataract surgeries, and has also a very keen interest in angle closure glaucoma. And he's going to take us through a different terrain from small pupil. We are now going to delve into cataract surgeries in eyes with corneal opacities in a, uh, SIC, with SICS. So let's hear from him. On to you, Dr. Deepa. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Dr. Debashish, uh, sir, just mentioned that, you know, uh, seeing well is the essence of surgery. You know, we need to ensure that we see well for the surgery to go on uh, uh, in an uneventful manner. And that's the challenge in this coronal opacities because uh, the visibility is severely compromised. And uh, are there any ways by which we can improve visualization during surgery? That is going to be uh, the focus. One way is to play with the light source and the angle of illumination, uh, if we can. So nowadays, you know, the most simple way to do is the inbuilt stereocoaxial illumination of microscopes, uh, which the modern microscopes have, like the Lumera I and the uh, Leica variants. They have the inbuilt stereocoaxial illumination, and that really dr dramatically changes the way we see things. Uh, initially, we were using oblique illumination with an external light source, like an endolimeter held at the limbus uh, across or a torchlight held at the limbus, and these all can be moved around and they can help us to see well. And uh, uh, the last one is obviously, you know, we, the newer way of illumination is illumination uh, from behind, that is using an uh, endolimiter like the Chandler's illumination through the vitreous cavity. Even that uses excellent visualization. And uh, the biggest challenge, as I tell you, was the visualization. Uh, and uh, there are ways by which we can play around with the incisions, uh, ensure that we have a uh, a clearer area where most of the maneuvers can be done. And these things have been planned on individual case basis uh, because uh, the situation, the location of the coronal opacity might vary from uh, patient to patient. So that is something which we need to uh, look and uh, uh, plan. And if we don't see well, that's the most common reason why complications can happen. So I think we need to be, you know, take a little bit of a more time. And this is how the same case looks with an inbuilt stereo uh, coaxial illumination. So that is the importance which I was hi highlighting that, you know, you having a, a different source of illumination than a traditional microscope will definitely help us to see things better. So it does play a role for having this. Now, if somebody has an older microscope, we can uh, switch on something like this device called as the OmniGlow and many similar devices. This was devised by Dr. Uh, Kakadia and is just an attachment wherein go and fix into the microscope. This is an old Zeiss F1 Pro. And by just adding this uh, illumination source, you get that enhanced red reflex. So that really helps us in uh, some complex cases like small pupil and the ones uh, with corneal opacity where uh, visualization is a problem. Now, this is how it is. Now, uh, this is the area of opacity and this is where we have to plan to work. So most of the instrumentation where has to be visualized through this. And incision location, again, depends upon the, uh, the where uh, the opacity is. And obviously, staining of the anterior capsule and using good viscoelastics do help to protect the endothelium and to help in better visualization. Uh, even the cataract is uh, immature, still staining helps a lot. And putting dollops of this HPMC over the cornea very frequently, uh, it enhances the visualization, at least momentarily and also magnifies the view so that uh, we can see well. Repeated injection or putting the uh, HPMC over the cornea does help. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an elderly lady. She's one-eyed, having black cataract and with dense uh, coronal opacity. It's an adherent leukoma-like picture. And also, she has got pathological myopia. Now, this is a situation where we need to plan surgery. In these cases, uh, I think the uh, manual small and cataract surgery is the best bet uh, because we've got multiple challenges to deal with. Apart from visualization, we have got coexisted difficulties like, you know, small pupil, adherent, uh, leukoma, and cynician, compromised endothelium. So how do we plan this incision? The incision is uh, planned in a... This is a case where I'm sitting superiorly. This is a superior incision because the 
uh, the uh, leukoma was at the uh, inferior inferomedial end and there is no compromise with the incision here because the the concept is very clear we want to be as autotraumatic as far as possible during nucleus delivery so i'm not intending to crack the nucleus in any way just to get the entire nucleus in a single plane so i'm making a maybe a 7 mm or 7.5 mm large spheral uh, sphericorneal tunnel incision trying to stain the capsule once i stain the capsule i can see that the capsule is also fibrotic in areas because of the long standing nature uh, and uh, the thing is in whenever we are having this uh, opacity uh, the trick is to once we make a, a nick in the capsule and try to grasp the flap so i'm trying to just release the uh, iris from the attachment to the back of the cornea that is the adherent leukoma i'm just using a micro scissors to just relieve it trying to work around the area of the fibrosis so once i get hold of the flap usually the rule is not to leave the flap until the opacity area is taken care of but unfortunately i lose the grip here but nevertheless i'm lucky enough to just go back and grasp the flap once again and uh, create the rexus the the secret is try not to leave the flap during that uh, area where the opacity is there so i'm mindful that the cataract is going to be very uh, large so i'm trying to enlarge the new uh, rexus here very uh, slow and minimal hydro dissection is done because this is a very deep nucleus Uh, with uh, hardly any epinucleus and cortex, and the posterior capsule will also be very thin and fragile. We need to be careful about that. I'm using sodium hyaluronate to uh, keep the chamber formed here. Uh, I'm using two Sinsky hooks to uh, nudge the nucleus to the periphery, engage the equator of the nucleus, and then bimanually dial the uh, two nucleus, uh, the, the nucleus out of the capsular bag into the anterior chamber. Oh. So although this area is not visible because of the uh, opacity uh, i am still able to visualize it in the other part again care is taken to create some space between the nucleus and the iris and the endothelium uh, i'm using the standard faco sandwich technique with the uh, uh, vectus and the dialer and it is pulled out effortlessly so the essence basically here is that you know you want to be as autotraumatic as possible be very liberal with your incision and the rexus so that Uh, the nucleus delivery is going to be very automatic one can use the simco cannula for uh, cortex aspiration as well i am using a bimanual uh, irrigation aspiration again the retro illumination mode is turned down so that the visibility is much better now because once the cataract is out we can see things well uh, again the area uh, under the opacity is going to be very tricky uh, i'm just trying to maybe retract the iris with my second instrument and try to uh pull out some of the cortex which is uh which is possible for me to remove again it is it's going to take some time i'm going to irrigate some uh, saline just to loosen up the cortex and once the intraocular lens is uh, uh, placed i'm going to use a suture here uh, to ensure that the uh, uh, the astigmatism is uh, under control although because because of opacity we don't have a control Uh, of the uh, cylinder which is going to be there so i'm going to use the uh, foldable intraocular lens into the bag and uh, care is taken that ensure that both the haptics are going uh, into the capsular bag and this is the part of the uh, iris which i want to cut just to ensure that the uh, the light can pass through this inferior uh, nasal quadrant so sort of an uh, op modified optical iridectomy just to help for the Uh, for better visualization and that's it i think if you can plan the surgery well and uh, uh, take all the adequate precautions most of the times the uh, we we tend to have good outcomes for this of course the vision cannot be compared with that of a, an eye with a healthy eye but it's functional in most parts and the patient do enjoy a good visual outcome which will help with the thing the last one uh, using a chandler illumination Uh, this is a film which i uh, borrowed from dr uh, rusha shroff and uh, they have made this wonderful <coughs> film where they demonstrated the use of uh, the chandler illumination to be placed through the pars plana uh, and uh, the illumination is pro what is provides is amazing basically you know uh, so just illuminating the vitreous cavity and the retro illumination which you get from that uh, it is just uh, quite amazing and this is how the view will be there Uh, with the uh, retroillumination from the uh, endoillumination through the past plan, that is the channel illumination. 
And with this, the illumination is truly uh, remarkable and uh, you can manage it pretty well in much more safer way. Obviously, they're demonstrating uh, phaco emulsification, uh, but nevertheless, it is something which we need to uh, know. So that was it. Thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Deepak. You brought out all the uh, salient points and some of the questions got swallowed in the process. Um, I'm going to ask you the questions and I would want thoughts of the expert panel too. Now, does it make sense to do, uh, you had shown a beautiful uh, case of doing an optical iridectomy. Now, do you need in more majority of these eyes with a lot of opacities and when you have decided to do an SICS and a hard cataract, would optical iridectomy become quite a routine step or would you now the way modern corneal surgeries are, would you look at doing a, a, a corneal a procedure following that? Uh, yeah, that this is an option depending upon the uh, the status of the coronal opacity. This yeah. was a vascularized coronal opacity and uh, uh, an elderly patient. And I don't think the most of the coronal surgeons <coughs> should be willing to uh, perform any coronal surgery. But if there is an opportunity to perform, if the coronal opacity is not dense, not vascularized, and the visual outcomes are uh, better with the coronal procedure, then why not? We can consider that as well. Yeah. And uh, in such in such cases, invariably your K would be taken from the opposite eye measurement, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, the other uh, question is that uh, if there is a, a severe corneal opacity, hello, are you asking from me? No, you have to switch off your video because there's a noise coming from your end. From my end. Yeah, that's what Mr. Sunil is saying. Only switch out the video. We want the audio of yours. We'll just try it. Yes. And I am muted. Oh, no, don't be muted. You can be on. Uh, uh, the other uh, important uh, thing I wanted to ask was, like, if there is a severe corneal opacity and the patient has a past history of viral keratitis, how would you treat these patients? Uh, I think uh, it's important to realize that the viral uh, the infection is not active, first of all. We need to take care of this. So if there's an inactive lesion, the, uh, there is no active infection or inflammation, uh, then we plan the surgery. If there is an active viral uh, disease, either in the form of infective epithelial keratitis or a stromal inflammation, then those things need to be addressed before taking the patient for surgery. Anything which others have to add, including Dr. John Sarkar, anybody, if you have anything yeah. to add. Yes, yes ma'am. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, this type of, I think, well, ma'am, it's a nice question. Uh, first of all, if it is a one-night patient and had a history of uh, HSV keratitis, we should be inquiring about these things. The patient, there should not be activation for last three months, more or less. If the patient first time came to us, I didn't know the patient about these things. They came for the only cataract surgery. Being a coronary person, what I usually follow, I don't jump for the surgery. I just wait for one month more as they already had a one-night patient and had a history very suspect HSB. So we should not jump for the surgery for the cataract surgery for the immediately. At least one month wait for that. If there is only reactivation and then we are doing this type of had a history of HSB keratitis under the coverage of a oral acyclovirmem. And it should be started 400 milligram, uh, preferably uh, twice in a day, seven days prior to the surgery. And is a close monitoring, and while we are giving the steroid immediate post op periods, and if it is needed, then we can carry on the things at least for the one month post operatively, and it should be closely monitoring the patient. It is not that the that epithelial lesion activation. I should be quiet because any stimulation, even also the patient with mental stress, also there is a high chance of HSB stimulation is there. So especially we should be much more cautious whenever we are operating for this type of patients. And one thing, if it is one at patient, ma'am, you were uttering that we have to take the, uh, I mean, the if the patient has the scar, this type of scar regarding the biometry, we are taking the axial end of that eye and keratin from the other eye. Suppose yes. if the patient, exactly, and if the patient is a one at patient, in yes. those cases, then we don't have the option. In those cases, we are taking the axial end of the, that eye and the standard K1, 40 by 40 by that eye. Okay. And yeah. then we get the predictable outcome of the post operative very good, very good. You brought out all the those extra small nuances which you wanted to Thank uh, you. any any uh, anything else from our expert panel. Uh, Dr. Deepak has done a wonderful surgery. Actually, from the very beginning, he was very careful that he made a large incision. 
and it was quite large and therefore he applied a suture also so that was wonderful and that uh, point should be taken care of by all the beginners and even experienced surgeons that is what i want to say thank you thank you dr kamal ji no, dr uh, chitra i have uh, yes. one or two points can i yes. say hina yes yes sure sure Fine. the excellent uh, as usual dr deepak nothing uh, uh, short of you know the video that we would expect from you two three points uh, the, you, what it did was iris uh, addis, additions to the cornea release with micro scissors that's a wonderful step and i think uh, any additions where it is bringing the iris forward has to be released during cataract surgery wherever it is two things will happen the, the along with the iris many times capsule bag also will be lifted up that will prevent the uh, slanting of the eye wall when you put the capsule bag when you put the lens inside the capsule bag the second is the sinica after surgery because the inflammation can progress laterally like a zipper and uh, they can close the uh, pas can extend after the surgery uh, to it will totally avoid pas happening and secondary glaucoma post operatively also will be avoided second is uh, uh, you would have done it but then it was not visible in the uh, video how did you remove the cortex under the opacity so what i would prefer is all the cortex in whatever situations <clears throat> we are in the cataract surgery needs to be removed and after removing the cortex in the periphery in the visible area in the same amount of effort same amount of this thing especially with the simco candle if you go under the opacity you will be able to remove the cortex the other option you would have done it but uh, uh, the other option is to rotate the uh, lens in the capsule or bag so that the haptic itself will loosen some amount of cortex and that get released into the anterior chamber which you can aspirate so these are a couple of uh, points i would like to uh, say and in such situations it's always nice to have a pre operative photograph along with you and uh, it like actually show see do when you dilate people the people is dilated sometimes post operatively we see that the, the, the hardly any slit available between the opacity and the edge of the pupil so if we have a photograph on the on 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 the table you know you can actually would know how much of sphincterotomy to done i would have rather done sphincterotomy inferiorly at 6 o'clock or whatever it is instead of temporarily where you are doing it under the opacity so that opens up little bit of uh, pupil in the pupillary area i do not know how the patient was post operatively you can comment on that Yes. Yes, Doctor Deepak. No, I uh, I did it in the inferior medial quadrant, sir. It was not in the temporal. It's in the inferior medial quadrant. The opacity was extending all the way up to six o'clock, from uh, center to the six o'clock, and there was a small area of clear cornea in the inferior nasal quadrant. So the inferior nasal quadrant was where the iris was cut. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do stay with us, uh, Doctor Deepak. We want. to have your expert opinions too 